So, uh, good morning. Good morning. At least it is uh, for me out here on the uh, West Coast. Thank you, Denise, for that uh, introduction. And uh, here we are in the middle of March 2020. And it would probably be an understatement to say that uh, there's a couple of things going on in the world from coronavirus to uh, national emergencies to uh, all sporting events being canceled. Putin and the Saudis are arguing about the price of oil, grocery hoarding, lots and lots of stuff to concern about. So uh, we have a lot of things to think about and we appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day to be with us to talk about supplier data and uh, QAD. Supply chain has been in the news big time over the last uh, several months. Harvard Business Review, uh, lots of articles about uh, the supply chain and the impact uh, worldwide and what major aspect of uh, our supply chains uh, are that don't include our suppliers. Our suppliers are basically our supply chains. So let's talk today about supplier data and what that means to QAD. In uh, January of 20, uh, 2020, on the 22nd, we talked about the basics of purchasing processing, uh, setup, purchasing control, a little bit about MRP, global recs, uh, discrete purchase orders, subcontract, blanket orders, et cetera. Uh, if you want to look at that uh, webinar, you could go to the 30 Studios Soft page and uh, view that webinar a uh, second uh, time if you'd like. So today we're gonna concentrate on communication with the suppliers and how we can improve that communication and interface. In today's session, we'd like to talk about uh, some supplier data, uh, some of the basic uh, static information that we need to have with our suppliers. We're going to cover supplier schedules and supplier consignment inventory. So uh, even though this is our second series or second webinar in our series on purchasing, we're not gonna be able to cover uh, everything that we want to. So on the 22nd of June, we're gonna have a part three where we'll talk about some uh, cost considerations. We'll look at the supplier pricing, uh, some accounts payable, talk about supplier performance, a little bit about the supplier uh, portal and uh, some more information now about purchasing. So purchasing is a huge uh, aspect of any QAD implementation and we wanna make sure we cover all of that. Uh, every time we have a webinar, we talk about the terminology. There's lots of new uh, words, terms that we need to be aware of when we talk about suppliers. Uh, and when we do that, we wanna make sure we've got solid work instructions, a work instruction for every menu process, and hopefully a good wiki or customer uh, company data dictionary so we can uh, have all of those uh, understandings because lots of people use different terms for the same kinds of uh, concepts. <coughs> Just a word of reminder about uh, Mowgli. Uh, Mowgli is the Materials Management Operation Logistics Evaluation. This is a uh, industry standard that uh, you can use as a self-assessment process uh, that can show you how you as an organization measure up to industry standards. In chapter six of Mowgli, uh, there's the supplier selection, supplier chain agreements, communication, receipt, assessment, so uh, I would highly recommend that you go to uh, odetta.org slash MOG slash information and read up on uh, Mowgli in that uh, chapter six with regards to purchasing. It's, uh, it was originally for the auto industry, but I've seen it effectively used in life science, uh, industrial consumer products. So it's a great uh, resource for you. Supplier data. The first thing you have to do when you create uh, a supplier is to create a business relationship. 
the business relationships in EE of QED are uh, records that contain locations and contact information for all addresses defined in the system, such as uh, banks, customers, employees, and you notice the last one is a supplier. So you need to set up uh, a business relationship for you, every, every one of your suppliers that you have. And uh, be aware of supplier numbering schemas. I've seen numbering schemas invented by uh, a buyer and then that buyer leaves the organization and uh, nobody remembers why they did it that way. Just uh, make sure everybody understands what the numbering schemas mean. Uh, they're significant, semi-significant. Just make sure you're aware of those relationships. Then once you've created the business relationship, you uh, do a 28.2.1.1 or 2820.1.1, the supplier create. And that has uh, a number of tabs uh, that regard the supplier. There's the business relationship. Uh, there's an accounting tab, a payments tab where you can create uh, credit terms, et cetera, all the banks that uh, the supplier is going to be uh, using. Uh, there's supplier types. The supplemental analysis fields can be defined for uh, your supplier's tax information, whether you use uh, Avalara or Cytex or Global Tax Management. Uh, you need to set up those tax uh, codes for the supplier and then uh, comments for your supplier. The accounting tab is probably the most critical, at least in my mind, as regards the supplier create. Uh, this contains your profile codes. Profile codes identify those relationships between records and shared sets of different types. Uh, there's Chamber of Commerce codes, tax ID codes, and then the two that uh, I find most beneficial are the purchase type and supplier type. These codes allow you to do some uh, very effective analysis of data regards your suppliers. Then once you've created the supplier in 2820.1.1, then you need to go back into 2.3.1, and 2.3.1 is the old SE definition of suppliers, and you need to do that in order to have uh, the operational side of QAD recognize uh, your supplier. So you put in your supplier, you create uh, supplier data. There's uh, a pricing uh, page for this, and we're going to cover that uh, much more extensively in our June webinar. Uh, then there's supplier terms data, uh, the credit, the uh, Dun & Bad Street, uh, discount uh, pricing. These are uh, input then on 2.3.1. And then there's uh, a 5.18.1 supplier item control. This regards supplier consignment uh, pretty specifically. And uh, it basically allows you to override the supplier consignment control and supplier consignment accounting controls by either supplier item or supplier uh, ID, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Then there's 1.19, supplier item maintenance, and this uh, allows you to do a cross-reference between our part number and the supplier part number. Uh, this also keeps track of uh, supplier lead times for reference, uh, quote prices, uh, manufacturing uh, part numbers, manufacturing item codes, uh, etc. So this gives you the chance to relate our part number to the supplier's uh, part number for uh, use in purchase supplier schedules, consignment, et cetera. You also have 5.1.1, which is the supplier ca calendar maintenance. And this allows you to define the uh, standard work week for your suppliers, uh, any exceptions in terms of operating uh, hours or operating days, and the supplier calendars are used by the schedule update from MRP, which calculates the releases that we'll see uh, a little bit later. So you need to define all of those. So we talked about purchase control or purchase orders and blanket orders on the 22nd. Now let's uh, understand supplier schedules. Supplier schedules are basically period-oriented schedules, not discrete part number quantity, but uh, 
period related, and they were originally designed for the automotive industry. Typically, you've got high production volumes, which you see in the automotive industry. You also see that in some life science uh, activities, long-term commitments with suppliers. These kinds of uh, relationships lend themselves to the use of supplier schedules. There's some uh, key events that occur in a supplier scheduling. Uh, the customer, you, determine what's needed and when it's needed. That has to do with MRP. And uh, as uh, I think most of us know, the MUG Midwest User Group, the West Coast User Group, Explore, the Southeast User Group, all were canceled. And I was going to give a presentation uh, about MRP at a couple of those. And uh, I think Nancy, uh, Alex, Denise, and I are going to uh, try and do another webinar in a couple of weeks and, and cover more of uh, MRP. So you run MRP, then you create a scheduled order, you schedule the releases for that from MRP and send it to the supplier. The order items are picked at the supplier. The order is shipped to uh, from the supplier to you, the customer, and the customer receives that order. If you look at 5.5, you can see that here are the uh, menus that are involved with supplier schedules, the setup, the processing, the receipts, and then the definition of supplier schedules, which we'll talk about. Uh, the purchase order is the primary tool that we find uh, most companies using for uh, purchasing. Blanket orders, I'm not a real big fan of uh, blanket orders. As you can see, MRP uh, doesn't work with it. Uh, receipts don't work with it. Uh, so blanket orders, eh. supplier schedules, however, are really effective tools for increasing and having control over what you're going to obtain from your suppliers. Uh, the flow is, as we said, outgoing. You uh, run MRP. You uh, create the schedule releases. You transmit those to your supplier. Uh, the supplier then builds or has that inventory on hand. They then ship it to you. You uh, receive that order either through ASNs or uh, regular uh, 2.13.1s, and then you can confirm the receipt and receive an inventory. So it's really not a very complicated process. The setup is that you, know, you got to kind of think about supplier schedules. I mean, they're fairly complex, but they are effective tools. So you need to understand your data and your configurations, your process, your procedures, uh, reporting requirements for both you and the supplier, uh, what you expect from the supplier, what the supplier expects from, from you. So there's a fair amount of upfront thought that needs to go into a supplier schedules project. Then once you uh, arrive at those, then you can go through uh, the setup, and the setup is basically creating your items. We've talked about that uh, numerous times in terms of uh, 1.4.1, 1.4.7, uh, general information, inventory planning, uh, rules of uniqueness of identification, the types of part numbers still apply. Uh, we talked to the supplier ID. We talked about the calendars. Uh, the setup in 5.18.24 is first you activate the particular function of supplier schedules. Uh, then you can have uh, supplier consignment uh, automatically default or not if you want to. There's a max aging days, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit less uh, farther on. And then uh, how do you use consignment? Do you default picking order, non-consignment, consign first, depending on how you want to do that. And then, then three 36.9.4, supplier accounting control, you can uh, set the transfer point and the point of cost, either receipt or uh, usage. In domain account control, you need to set up some uh, consignment accounts, uh, the PO consignment inventory account and the offset account. Uh, you can, uh, we, as we talked to get about before, you can do that by product line. So you need to define those in your account code 
and then uh, make sure that those accounts in those consignment uh, fields or frames in the 1.2.1 are properly set. For sites and locations, uh, there is this transfer ownership flag in both the site and the location files. And this basically tells the system how you're going to treat those uh, values. Once you've done the setup, then you're going to create a scheduled order. A scheduled order consists of basically the purchase order and the supplier. Uh, there's order data, which has to do with shipping credit, and then the line items that are associated on that supplier schedule. So in opposing the purchase order, which is a part number quantity date, this is a schedule which goes out a number of weeks that you define. Uh, and you've got a number of schedules associated with that, a receipt schedule planning and shipping schedule that you can uh, then coordinate with your supplier. The order data uh, on the schedule order maintenance, here's the purchase order and the supplier. Uh, start and end effectivity dates are critical. That has to do with uh, when the supplier schedules are in effect. Uh, you can determine whether you're going to print schedules, use EDI, uh, et cetera, and then uh, have order revisions, order revision dates, because as with most things in our ERP systems, things are going to change. So the schedule order line maintenance, this is basically financial information, uh, purchase accounts. Uh, uh, you can also use consignment uh, for scheduled uh, orders, uh, units of measure, unit of measure conversions, subcontracts, those uh, functionality are all available for scheduled orders. The order line data frame two is uh, has to do with the scheduling parameters of the supplier schedule. You can set the firm date, and uh, as it says, to determine the best value for firm dates, run the schedule from MRP uh, with update set to no, and then give you a good idea of what that uh, firm schedule should be. You can have uh, scheduling days. Uh, this is used by the schedule update from MRP and the scheduling export uh, functions uh, and how things are bucketed for schedules. Uh, number of weeks, number of months. Uh, you can have authorization for fabrication at the supplier in addition to raw material uh, procurement authorization for the supplier. So you can really nail down the relationship and the uh, tool for supplier scheduling for the uh, supplier. You've got transfer dates, safety dates, uh, container items, uh, standard pack quantities. This all has to do with the scheduling of those individual lines on the order. So then you process the schedule, and it's really pretty simple. You create the schedule release once you've got the order. You create the schedule release. You review, modify, and maintain. This is probably the biggest issue because, as with all MRP systems, things are going to uh, change, schedules are going to change, customers are going to change their mind, and so you need to really keep a handle on maintaining and modifying uh, those schedules. Then you transmit those schedules uh, of release to the supplier. You really need to understand the schedule buckets that we looked at in that order line data. And you need to understand and agree between you and your suppliers on these scheduling buckets in terms of items, lead times, quantities, transactions, because this is how the MRP is going to treat these scheduled orders and how uh, the supplier is going to be required to ship against them. Uh, the 5.1.17 is your schedule order MRP percentage maintenance. And here you can, uh, for a part number supplier PO, you can determine uh, the percentage of a particular purchase order that you want to go to one supplier versus another supplier. So you really have to think about uh, what that relationship is and the capabilities of suppliers. Then 5.5.3.1, uh, generates the schedule update from MRP. 
So this is what actually creates the uh, supplier schedule release form. And here in 5.5.3.3, you can see you've got the release ID, and then you can uh, set quantities. Uh, you can have MRP recognize either planned or firmed uh, relationship of that uh, supplier schedule as uh, you're going to be running MRP uh, probably at least on a weekly basis. So you want to be able to uh, have MRP do that automatic rescheduling uh, for you. Then in the resource authorization uh, tab or frame, you can define to the supplier uh, what quantities he's allowed to fabricate, uh, how far in the future he's allowed to go out and buy raw material to support this schedule. It's got start and end dates for each of those, and then you can release or uh, relate those to the queue orders for advanced repetitive. Next step is to transmit the uh, schedule to the supplier. So you've got the supplier, you've got your release. Now you need to get that information out to uh, the supplier. You can do a simple schedule print. You can fax it. Uh, if you want to talk to Alex or uh, Denise or Nancy about uh, LBOX, uh, you can use LBOX uh, 32 soft to uh, transmit that data. Uh, you can use 35.4.8 if you want to export this and use this for EDI. Now, not all of us have EDI. Uh, it requires a fair amount of setup in the back end, but uh, you can have this uh, process of notifying the supplier of what his schedule is going to be, either by printing, faxing, or uh, through EDI. Then. The supplier has the schedule. He's got the inventory. He's manufacturing inventory. He's going to ship it to you. So you need to process the receipt. That is done through an automated ship notice. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, shipper and containers. Or you can uh, just do a direct receipt, 5.13.1. Uh, 35.1 is document import. And here you can... Uh, receive that information that's sent to you through EDI, either in uh, SSN format or load the files directly into uh, the document repository. Again, a fair amount of setup and uh, coordination with IT is required uh, for that, but that will get the information into your system. Then you can create a PO container. PO container is uh, basically a subset of a shipper, and it's what is in a particular pallet or box uh, as defined by that information coming across through the uh, advanced ship notice. Then 5.5.5 uh, .5 is your PO shipper maintenance. So once you've created your uh, container IDs, you can go in and create a shipper uh, <coughs> maintenance. And here you can see you've referenced the container ID on that uh, PO shipper. You can also uh, do a PO, uh, PO shipper receipt, 5.5.11, which basically creates your RCT-PO, puts the parts into the inventory, and receives that uh, PO shipper that you've created. As I mentioned, if you're not want to worry about 35.1, 5.5.4, 5.5.5, 5.11, all that, you can just do a PO receipt. And we talked about PO receipts in uh, January. You just simply go in and do a PO receipt. Here's the uh, line level. This basically creates an RCT PO and increases the quantity on hand and decreases the uh, order quantity on the scheduled receipt. And you can see those uh, in the transaction history file. So supplier schedules are great tools. POs, Everybody uses them, blanket orders, a eh, little bit. Scheduled receipts or scheduled uh, supplier schedules are e excellent tools to uh, control your interface with your supplier. Now you, we've gone through the setup. It's very easy to process, and you can uh, receive just basically as normal. I'd recommend that you go and look at supplier scheduled training guide off the uh, document list in the support if you have any uh, any detailed questions. So now that we understand purchase orders, blank orders, and supplier schedules, let's look at 
supplier consignment inventory. And Apex defines uh, the supplier consignment, both in terms of customer consignment, which we'll cover a little bit later in the year. Uh, but here we're going to look at supplier consignment. And this is the process of a supplier placing goods at the customer location, our location, without receiving payment until the goods are actually used. So why would you do consignment? Well, you only pay for what you've been what you've used. If you use purchase orders, you pay for the whole thing, put it in inventory, and maintain uh, that cost of carrying and the full cost of the purchase order. With consignment, you only pay for what you use. So it decreases inventory investment. There's usually less inventory obsolescence because the supplier is controlling uh, the inventory. There's better interaction and productivity and more communication with the supplier. Uh, the accounting functions are uh, streamlined and uh, processed much more efficiently and uh, effectively. And as I said, the supplier uh, manages their own inventory in uh, this process. The business objectives are when you do supplier consignment, you receive normally. You defer the ownership. You defer the voucher and AP activity. You satisfy MRP, which is uh, primary uh, goal of the supplier consignment. You manage the inventory, the accounts, the values, the balances uh, through the supplier uh, consignment functionality. And then you can recognize the usage of that supplier consignment, uh, either to issues or transfers. Uh, it creates an audit trail in the uh, standard transaction history, uh, triggers vouchers, uh, evaluated receipts, settlements, effectively through the use of that. So the life cycle of supplier consignment is straight, pretty straightforward. You create a contract, okay? You, you agree with the supplier what they're going to uh, supply, how they're going to uh, consume it. Then you receive product from them. That consignment goes into inventory with all of your other inventory into the stock room. And then you pick the material out of your stock room. You transfer it, ship it, manufacture, distribution, whatever you uh, want. And then through the setup of the consignment values, either both in uh, terms of accounts or the transactions, then you record usage. That usage is then given to the supplier, supplier creates an invoice, accounts payable, then does a voucher, and they send them a check. So it's a, a very efficient way to do that. There's uh, some design cons considerations that we need to uh, look at, uh, just like with supplier schedules, you really need to understand uh, your procedures, your processes, your product uh, expectations, reporting, all of that needs to be coordinated uh, through the supplier and uh, your purchasing uh, functions. So with inventory locations, there are going to be multiple ownership transfer points. There's going to be lots of ways that you can use inventory, transfer inventory, store inventory, uh, and that is going to be controlled through that transfer of ownership flag that we saw on 1.1.18 and one dot. Uh, one to 13, the site uh, management. So component issues, back flush, sales orders, final assemblies, transfers, unplanned issues, cycle and physical counts. Uh, and you really need to define how locations are going to be set up and the attributes uh, defined for that. The basic process is you accept consigned material to specified locations, you consume it, you transfer ownership, you pay the vendor, and that all needs to be defined in uh, this supplier consignment process. Uh, as far as accounting is concerned, there's uh, a fair amount of uh, accounting on the uh, finance side. Uh, there's new accounts that have to be set up, the consignment inventory account, consignment offset account that we saw in 1.2.1 uh, .1 in the domain account control. Uh, there's system and account controls, your product line purchase account maintenance. So that all needs to be uh, defined with your cost accountant 
and uh, your buyer and suppliers. There are basically three ways to set up consignments. You can include consignment in inventory from a financial point of view. Uh, you can define consignment within total assets, but not inventory. And uh, thirdly, you can define it uh, with this offset of liabilities uh, that I mentioned. As far as uh, vouchering is concerned, uh, there is a pending voucher file. Uh, if you look at ERS, when you do a, a receipt, you've got a, a automatic update of the pending voucher file with consignment, you're able to separate what can be vouchered from what cannot be vouchered. It contains uh, open quantity to voucher. This separates the PO receipt history from vouchering. Uh, this is required for consignment, and it basically simplifies the ERS process with a single point of data. And when you update this pending voucher file, uh, non-consigned activity just goes through regular uh, consigned activity then uh, gets postponed basically for uh, this process. Supplier consignment common functionality, you establish the data requirements we saw for the contracts uh, in these uh, orders. Uh, you determine the receiving process, we will talk about record usage, uh, establish reporting throughout the entire process, and there's lots of reports available uh, so that the supplier and you understand where inventory is, what's been consumed, what's been invoiced. Uh, then you process the vouchers, and then you can also uh, update the aging of inventory in your uh, consignment uh, process. Uh, there's valuation report, so I'll just mention the SACO account and physical tags. Uh, the 3.6.1 inventory valuation report, I'm sure a lot of us have used uh, this report. You've got these uh, options down here, uh, supplier consignment, either exclude or uh, include. You also can print cycle count worksheets for product that is uh, consigned, either in customer consignment or supplier consignment. You can include it, exclude it, only do uh, consigned uh, tags or worksheet uh, cycle counts. You can do the same for physical inventory. You can create tags for uh, supplier consignment or cons uh, customer consignment. There is uh, a 5.18.25.1 consignment inventory adjustment. And uh, you can use this to manually modify consigned inventory information such as quantities, locations, and I'm sure that anybody who uses the consignment module if, uh, effectively uh, finds themselves using this uh, consignment inventory adjustment uh, quite a lot <clears throat> because it's a tool that lets you keep your records uh, in balance. There are uh, aging. The supplier consignment module provides functionality for managing aging dates in inventory. Uh, you can do it by setting a new aging date or adding uh, dates to existing. We saw in the control file, 5.18.24, there's a maximum uh, aging date that uh, you can use. And then there are a number of reports that can be generated uh, to do this. You can also change uh, ownership status uh, through this aging update. You can do the aging uh, inventory update by batch, uh, either a range or setting a new date by a range of items, a range of purchase orders, suppliers, et cetera. And then once you've got that inventory, then you need to look at how you're going to receive this product. So basically consignment handles uh, debits and credits to the supplier account, the consignment accounts. Uh, what we want to do is hold off the receipt of inventory from a financial point of view in the inventory. So here we have the uh, CN-RCT, and these uh, transactions were basically introduced in uh, 20 or 2008 SE. And so you receive it, then you use it, and then the usage triggers 
uh, the RCT-PO and the ISS CN-ISS issue that actually records that product and then allows that usage to be transmitted to uh, the user. So you really need to be familiar with these new transaction uh, types that are for this consignment uh, process. You create the purchase order. There's uh, the field in the header that is activated by the 5.18.24. Uh, you can also uh, tell which particular line is uh, going to be uh, used for consignment. Uh, you can modify uh, by purchase order the maximum aging and cost point that we looked at by purchase order. And so you're going to do the RCT dash or the CN dash RCT, which actually receives it into inventory. But from a financial point, it's going to put it into that PO consignment account. Then there is the 5.18.6 consignment inventory report, which shows Items, site information, location information, supplier consignment detail, receipt information. Uh, there's also a uh, 518.7 consignment inventory by order. This is a uh, critical report and should be exchanged with your supplier often. I would recommend at least on a weekly basis, for sure on a monthly basis, to make sure that everybody is in agreement on uh, what has happened with that consignment inventory. Then once the issue has taken place, we find ourselves doing a, a CNISS, and that then triggers the RCT-PO, which actually does the processing and the accounting in the background to transfer ownership from us as the customer uh, or from the supplier to us as uh, the customer. <clears throat> The 518.8 .8 consignment usage report is uh, also uh, an extremely critical uh, report that you're going to uh, reconcile with your supplier on a monthly basis. This shows usage, uh, subtotal of quantities over specified dates. So this 518.8 uh, .8 is again, another very uh, critical aspect of your reporting requirements and the uh, supplier reporting consignments. So the consumption of uh, consignment inventory can either be through uh, issues to work orders, final assemblies, distribution, repetitive orders. Uh, you can have consumption triggered by ISN-UNPs, by uh, single item transfers or multi-item transfers, or uh, distribution orders. So all of these uh, usages that you find yourself uh, consuming the supplier uh, consignment inventory are covered and are going to be processed by this uh, relationship between the voucher and the accounts for your consignment inventory. So consignment inventory, another great tool for uh, operating with the supplier community. It gives you uh, visibility of supplier material at your facilities. Uh, it records usage and allows you to defer that vouchering and payment. So it's an effective tool for reducing cost and increasing the communication between yourselves and your suppliers. I would highly recommend uh, both supplier schedules and supplier consignment be considered as part of your uh, quiver of arrows in relationship to uh, the supplier community, especially in these uh, stressful times that we find ourselves. <clears throat> as I mentioned in uh, June, which is a fair amount, and hopefully we'll be through most of this by then, but we'll talk uh, about some cost considerations for purchasing. We'll cover uh, supplier pricing, look at the evaluated receipt settlement, talk a little bit about accounting, logistics accounting, et cetera. I want to show you what the supplier performance tool is. Uh, that's one of the chapter six uh, activities that uh, Mowgli is very, very uh, concerned with. 
And uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the supplier portal, which is another great tool that QID uh, gives you that uh, can increase that communication between you and supplier. We'll talk about some reports and then some utilities. So purchasing, huge area of uh, QED, and we're going to talk uh, about that uh, more on June 22nd. There are uh, a lot of uh, loaders that uh, 32 Soft has. We've talked about uh, supplier maintenance. We talked about supplier schedules. Uh, we've talked about consignment. These are all uh, covered by various loaders that uh, Alex and the team have developed. And if you have any questions, uh, contact Denise, myself, Alex, Nancy, anybody. We'd uh, love to give you a uh, demo or explain a little bit more about that. Uh, not just purchasing loaders, but you've got uh, all sorts of tools uh, for price lists, for bombs for pr uh, production planning and execution, inventory, uh, master files, lots and lots of tools available uh, for loaders because all of us know that uh, sometimes getting data into QAD is a little bit uh, challenging. So. so if you think of something afterwards, give us a call or shoot us an email and we will include any questions we receive um, when the email is published, right up until it is published. Um, so we'll just go ahead and move along for the moment. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, we are, due to conference cancellations and the state of things globally, we're looking to add some additional educational or information sharing types of opportunities. And to start, we have added on April 8th, MRP, How to Make It Fail. So this is a new one that you probably have not seen um, anywhere, but it will be, the registration link for it will be at the bottom of your Encore email that you'll receive early next week, if not sooner. Um, then we also have our already scheduled April and May webinars, QAD SSM. It's shipped, now how do I manage it? And May, more tips to manage QAD inventory. All of these will be led by Don, and we are hoping to add some guest presenters into the mix as well. Uh, let's take a look real quick. Still no questions. So as a final thought, um, it is a big mistake to think of your supplier as a separate entity. Because Great. that, Great. Yep, that, that supplier is a direct extension of your business and your brand. So. Elbow bump. Where'd you get Elbow that bump. You caught that. <laughs> yep. That was not that's easy great. to find. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that was uh, that's perfect. Perfect. So I did do a circle back. No additional questions. Um, so Don, Alex, or anyone, is there anything else we want to add before we close out for this month's session? Uh, just uh, a comment about uh, supplier schedules and uh, uh, supplier consignment. They They are... Uh, new concepts for a lot of people, and uh, the setup is uh, somewhat intensive, and the maintenance of the data, both for supplier schedules and supplier consignment, is uh, extensive, and I would highly recommend that you go on to the document library and get the training guide for both the supplier orders and the uh, supplier consignment. There's lots of great information in there, delves uh, a little bit more into the accounting side of the function that I didn't get a chance to uh, talk about. But uh, the document library out in QED, <coughs> excellent uh, resource. So again, from uh, our point of view, we feel very uh, sad that uh, we won't be able to see a lot of uh, our friends at uh, MUG, West Coast, the West Coast User Group, uh, Explore, uh, because of the cancellations, but uh, we will try and uh, provide as much of the education that we hope will assist you over the next couple of months as we work through this uh, social distancing and the whole yeah. question of coronavirus. So yeah. all our love and, and we hope yep. things are fine. 
And we do, we, we are open to, you know, again, not just questions about this particular webinar, but if there are questions that we can assist with, we're always happy to do so and help you find your answers. And I do also want to take a moment to mention that we do have a section on our website. It's EDU32, and that's filled with all sorts of additional information. So if you want to bone up on some of your QAD, MRP, ERP stuff, that could provide, could be a good resource for you. So certainly take a look there as well. And um, so, yeah, thanks very much for your time today, everybody. I hope you will join us for our April and additionally added webinars. But um, meanwhile, have a super day and uh, keep healthy, everybody. Thanks yes. again for your time.